Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a fantastic Sunday Night Live here on the Living Theosophy YouTube channel. We are going to be premiering this, so you'll be live in the chat, but this has been pre-recorded, but we will be there in real time to answer your chat questions. But I also encourage you to leave your comments in the comment section. We will get around to answering your questions. There's so many questions, more so than answers, as we're all on this journey together. Living Theosophy is a channel about love and compassion and unity. And we have a very special guest tonight. I was just watching one of his videos that I highly recommend. Though a completely different YouTube channel, I cannot say enough wonderful things about it. It is the self-actualization of Greta Garbo. And that is how I was introduced to our guest tonight, is being told about that particular, um, it was a speaking event at Watkins Books in London uh, from the Theosophical Society headquarters in England. And so we've invited him to be here with us tonight. So Moon Laramie is the editor of the Modern Theosophy series, short volumes and representing important texts from the history of the Theosophical movement. Paired with writing by contemporary Theosophists, including Pablo Sender, Jenny Baker, Petra Meyer, and Dr. Barbara B. Herbert. He is the author of Spirit of Garbo, a spiritual biography of the legendary Swedish film star. And that was described by Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio as a spiritual manual for many beneficial spiritual pursuits. I'm gonna say that again. This has been described as a spiritual manual for many beneficial spiritual pursuits. So uh, Moon has written for a number of spiritual publications, including Kindred Spirit and The Best You and Watkins Magazines. Blavatsky Unveiled, I'm holding a copy that he so lovingly sent me. We're gonna be talking about this book tonight. This is a fantastic text and extremely timely. Blavatsky Unveiled, volume one. So this is only the beginning of an ambitious publishing project to present the writings of Madame Blavatsky in modern English. Do you know how important that is? That is essential. So Moon was born in London, in England in 1966. He studied English literature, American studies, and creative writing at the University of Middlesex, and that was from 1987 to 1990. During the 1990s, he lived in Sweden, where he worked as an English teacher, and I want to say Gothenburg. Is it uh, Jettebor? How would you say that? Is it Gothenburg? Is that correct? In, in Swedish, it, it's Jettebor. Yeah, Jettebor. Let's say Jettebor and Malma. And on returning to the UK in 1995, he studied holistic therapies, including geothermal therapy, Reiki, Indian head massage, and meditation. He became a Reiki master in 2005. And between 2008 and 2015, he worked as a rights advisor for the United Nations Children's Fund. He joined the Theosophical Society in England in 2016. He is now a full-time author, and we are very grateful for that, and he divides his time between London and Norfolk, England. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the one and only Moon Laramie. I'm very excited tonight. Welcome, Moon. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. I can't not say enough about that, that amazing presentation that you did at Watkins. I highly recommend everybody check that out. And of course, tonight's episode, as we talk about the work that you are doing, again, this is uh, called Blavatsky Unveiled. Uh, many of the, well, some of the students uh, here, we're all students of Theosophy, might be familiar with this, Isis Unveiled, and it is a daunting text, to say the least. Moon, how would you describe, to someone who has not come across Isis Unveiled or your text, how would you describe Isis Unveiled to someone who's never heard of it before? I think it's a wonderful revelation, because it brings together all of the the knowledge from the different faith traditions, and it puts them all in one place and joins up the dots. I think if, 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 if I was gonna give a very simple description of it, I think, I think it holds those wonderful truths of everything and, and kind of shines a light on the pathway to understanding um, what our journey is. Well, it's a very concise description of a very big text. <laughs> and what you've done here in uh, Blavatsky Unveiled, as we touched on in the introduction, is that here you're talking about making it um, available in modern day language. That is an uh, incredible task. And I know we have some, uh, some clips that we, I'd like to bring up, but I wanted to ask you um, some personal questions a little bit about your own journey. When did you know that you loved theosophy? And can you tell us about your first experience with it? Well, I'd, I'd been on quite a path, really, as, as, as you read out, that I'd, 
I'd studied Reiki, and at one point I was a, I was a neo-pagan, so I was doing Wicca um, for a couple of years. So I, I tried lots and lots of different paths, and I was always looking for an answer. Um, you know, I, I often look up at the sky and look up at the stars at night and, and think to myself, goodness, what is going on? You know, <laughs> what is, actually, we're, we're on this little ball of rock. Yes. In the middle of this huge, unending expanse. And I just think to myself, there's, there's so many questions. Um, and really, when I came to theosophy, it was the first time that I thought, this is telling me mm. all, of the, all of the answers. And, and there was nothing, um, there was no dogma involved. You know, a, a lot of theosophists say that you can, you can study theosophy and disagree with lots and lots of different things. Yes. So I just think it was a, a wonderful, um, freeing experience when I first came to it and and I'd read um, a friend of mine said Madame Blavatsky is a fascinating character so I got hold of Gary Lapman's uh, yes. Yes. biography of her and I was absolutely thrilled I thought she was an amazing character mm. and when I finished the book I thought I wonder if the Theosophical Society is still there if it still exists so I googled it and found out it was just down the road so I went along and there was this wonderful session that used to happen on a, on a Sunday afternoon mm -hmm. where it was kind of like a, a, an introduction to theosophy a kind of theosophy 101 and I went a, a few times to that and I was just hooked I thought this is marvelous this is absolutely marvelous so so I very soon joined and then I was going to lectures and, and study groups all the time after that. I know it feels so right, doesn't it? It feels like the holy grail, the end of a quest. You find that like, this is what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And it is for everyone. It belongs to no one and everyone at the same time. And it is timeless and ancient uh, and the future <laughs> and mm -hmm. all that. Um, another question I like to ask my guests before we get into the book is how would you describe theosophy uh, to someone who has never heard of the term? Uh, when some people are like, oh, I've never heard of that. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm sure you get that when people say, what is it that you're writing about? And someone who's not familiar with it. Um, and there are people that are gonna be crossing this channel and clicking into this, this interview. And I'd love for you to be able to answer that question in your own words, if you wouldn't mind. Please. Um, for me, um, well, HPB said theosophy is not a religion. Right. So for me, it's kind of a collection of, of seekers um, exploring that path with each other and I think what what Blavatsky has done has provided a lot of material for us to digest mm -hmm. and of course as, as she says we're only really scratching the surface the yeah. books that she's written are, are just scratching the surface so I think really it's kind of it just it brings everything together I think that for me there's nothing that I would say um, when I think about different different traditions that I've explored, there's always a question as to, well, why is that so? And I can't find find a suitable answer for it. But I think theosophy does provide those. I mean, again, we're only scratching the surface, but there's nothing for me that, that is an unanswered question when I think about, you know, where do we come from or oh. where are we going or what's the point of... Of, of our existence, you know, those, those fundamental questions. And, and there are a lot of traditions that, that I, I found don't really answer that fully. Um, whereas I think theosophy does. So it's, it's so rounded and it's so open and, and theosophists are just so much fun to be around as they well. They are, they yeah. are. And there are a lot, there's a, a way of, it's a way of life. It's not just a study, it's a way of living. And so I remember being at my father's funeral in 2019 and the death to me, I was feeling, you graduated, I was happy for him. This was a very, um, and, and they were like, not everybody feels that way, you need to, and I'm like, but this is such a, this is a natural thing, death is natural. And and we talked for a long time before his, his death. And um, I just would love to be able to put it into my life. I wish I would have discovered it earlier. It came along when it did. Uh, and it is, it is simply a way of living. And it is the underlying principle of all the world's religion, sciences and philosophy as Moon has brilliantly explained uh, in a language that we're going to be able to understand a little bit better. I'm gonna include all the links to where you can get a hold of this book. And as Moon did say, uh, Blavatsky did write down, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky wrote down, she did not come up with and write it down. She wrote down some of the most substantial texts of the last 2000 years and they are, a huge, massive, colossal, but like he said, 
they're just the surface, which is so incredibly overwhelming. So here we have this just hit store shelves. This is brand, brand new. Um, and it is, um, it's called The Writings of H.P. Blavatsky in Modern English. Now, I had a look at it and reading it without the language of the 19th century and with a modern day translation was terribly exciting. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, let's just begin with an introduction from the author of Blavatsky Unveiled, please. Uh, well, as you say, it's, it's basically every sentence and every paragraph in the same order in more modern English. So one of the, the, the obstacles I, I, I found and other people have said is that Blavatsky writes such beautiful prose. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful, it's poetry. But it, again, as we move away from Victorian times, it becomes more and more difficult for us to access. Mm. So um, there, in, in the modern English language, the average sentence is 15 to 20 words long. Mm. But in Victorian English, there are sentences that are 100 words long. I mean, there's one in, in Isis Unveiled, in those first seven chapters, that's 207 words long. Oh, and it's, it's, it's beautifully written, but it's very difficult for us as modern readers to, to digest. So what I wanted to do with this was to help with the study of Blavatsky's wonderful works. So to kind of take away that that obstacle of the comprehension of the sentence so that you can explore the ideas more, more easily. And it's almost like when I was at school, we did Shakespeare and we had to sit in class and put every sentence into modern English. And nowadays, um, children have, have modern English versions of Shakespeare plays to help them with accessing the Shakespeare. So in a way, I think of it as similar to that. I mean, you can read it as a standalone text and think about the wonderful ideas that are expressed in it, but I think true students of theosophy will use it as well to go back to the original text and study the original text more deeply and, and think about those questions more fully. So I think of it as, as being of service to, to everybody else that, that they can you know, access these books. And, and I think quite often, you know, we don't always pick up the original Blavatsky texts and, and, and explore them. So hopefully uh, we can do more of that now. Well, it can be overwhelming if you crack the secret doctrine or you crack uh, Isis and Baal, literally, if we were just to read a sentence or two, it will be, uh, it is something you just have to take off, like eating something, the moon in bites. You can only take, sorry, I didn't mean to use the word moon when your name is moon. I was trying to think of something large, but I'm vegan and I didn't want to go with elephant. So, uh, but you can eat it all at one time. You can take a bite and um, digest that and then go back and revisit it. And I don't know how it works, but these always reveal more and deeper meanings. And so my question to you would be, what made you think uh, in this modern world, in this digital world, which is so essential that we use these tools, I believe that Blavatsky and everyone, all caught, all of them, judge, would have used the internet to their advantage to communicate with the world. What brought you to the decision to say, hey, I'm going to go ahead and make this available for the world of today, 2020? What was it that made you think that it was time to do that? Um, well, I was I was reading it. I, I actually opened Isis Unveiled and I thought I'm going to start making notes mm. on, on the different pages. But when I came back to it, I, my little scribbled notes, I couldn't really follow them. And there was just so much information. So um, I thought it was really important to have to have have the, the work presented as a, a kind of a modern tool and also to put in um, explanations of all of the things that are mentioned in that original text that we in the modern world don't really know about. So Blavatsky mm -hmm. talks about scientists of the day and mesmerists and mm -hmm. um, Indian fakirs of the day. And we don't know who a lot of those people are. So I wanted to present an explanation of who the people were mm -hmm. and the different terms that she talks about, the ancient texts that she talks about, you know, lots of notes and references and a full who's who so that you're able to, to say to yourself, well, I understand fully now Thank what you. she's talking about when, she's, when she talks about the Popol Vuh, the Mayan book of the, of the people. Yes. You know? so, um, so, yeah, you just flick to the notes section and, and you, you can understand it much more easily. So mm -hmm. I think it's accessibility, which is really important um, for, to bring people in. 
Well, it's true. Accessibility, as you were saying, um, but there are some theosophists that don't want to go into the modern world. Um, not many, but there are some that say, no, 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 you must come to it. I am on, in the camp that is absolutely, we must use the tools at hand. Everybody is here. They're on their phones. They're in the digital world. And that is where we're going to be meeting people. That's where people are getting their information. They are scrolling and they, they might sit down and read a book, but wouldn't it be fantastic if they can digitally access this information uh, and watch a video or whatever and be able to listen to it or uh, listen to the author speak about it because that's where the world is. What are your thoughts on that? about bringing theosophy into the modern world. I, I mean, think it's very important. Do you, yeah, do you, I, some, I, some lodges are very much against it. Um, well, I, I think you, you can do it in different ways, can't you? I mean, you can, there are so many different platforms mm -hmm. that you can choose how you want to present, present the ideas. I think, um, I think personally, if Blavatsky were here today, she would feel it was important that people had access Yes. to the ideas um so i think it's 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 very important to keep the door open mm -hmm. to everybody not necessarily to go out and and sort of um try and, and push ideas down people's throats but as long as the door is open yes people can have a look in and think oh yeah. here's the thing i've been waiting for all my life i know i know brilliant explanation thank you one last question before we get to actually the text how long did this take you to put together when you started sat down put pen to paper or finger to uh keyboard how long was from start to finish uh four and a half years it took, and that was every day about three hours a day that's you um, yeah because sometimes um i spent over a day or just on one sentence I understand. I understand. and there are particular things that, that, that were difficult to kind of, of find out what they were mm -hmm. I mean there's, there's one thing that she talks about called the the magic on which is is a text about occultism and magic and it's written by somebody called Dr Paulus mm -hmm. and could I find out who Dr Paulus was no it was really really difficult so I just kind of tried to, to put together as much information as as was available. So sometimes it would flow really easily, but other times, you know, I, I'd be spending hours and hours just on one sentence and, and looking up the people she mentions or trying to work out the best way to, to put the text into modern English and, and sort it out um, and present it the best way. So it, it was a very, very slow journey. Uh, yeah. but wonderful, I love doing it. Nice cup of tea and sometimes a chocolate biscuit. And, uh, <laughs> Oh, good. Well, you deserve more than a chocolate biscuit for this. This is going to help many. And we're so grateful that you're here to share with us. We have several slides uh, that we can bring up. If you're ready to, would you like to go ahead and, um, and begin? There it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, this is just an example. This is from the introduction. And this is just an example of the original text and how it's been rendered into modern English. So that first paragraph there, which starts the Great Kingdoms and finishes with Descended, that is the original, uh, a slice of original text from Isis Unveiled. Mm. So I'll just read it out. I think it's it's almost a hundred words long, I think, I, or between 70 and hundred words long. So it says, the great kingdoms and empires of the world after reaching the culmination of their greatness, descend again in accordance with the same law by which they ascended. Till, having reached the lowest point, humanity reasserts itself and mounts up once more, the height of its attainment being, by this law of ascending progression by cycles, somewhat higher than the point from which it had before descended. Mm. Now, it's a beautifully written sentence, but as a, a as a modern reader, I personally find it yeah. quite challenging. It's um, yeah, yeah. There's lots of commas, lots of clauses in there. Um, so what we've done with Blavatsky Unveiled is taken the exact same sentences and just rendered them into four shorter sentences. Oh. Uh, so it says, the great kingdoms and empires of the world are subject to a cyclical law of rise and fall. They reach a peak of civilization and then decline again. When they have reached their lowest point, they rally and rise again. The cyclical law of rise and fall ensures that each new peak of civilization rises higher than its predecessor. Yeah, 
that's all done. I love that. I love that. This is so important. And it just seems to be when the, uh, it, the time is right. It just feels like the time is so right for this. Um, did you want to move on to another slide or did you want to stay on this one? You tell me what you want to do. Uh, no, we can, we can look at the next slide. Okay. Okay, here comes slide two. Moon, where are we at on this one? This is the opening chapter of Blavatsky Unveiled. So this is all in the modern English now. Um, and what I wanted to just show was uh, that um, if you look at that second paragraph where it says all hermetic philosophers share a belief founded on 70,000 years of experience, there's a little footnote there. Yeah. And then later on in the, in the back of the book, um, there are footnotes, explanations for everything that is footnoted in, in the book. So, so there'll be an, an, an explanation in the footnotes of what hermetic means if, if you're not sure. And, and I've tried to do this for a broad readership. So anyone who is coming to theosophy completely new and coming to you know, the study of hermeticism, occultism, etc., and the esoteric tradition, then they'll think, oh goodness, what is hermetic? What does that mean? So they can then quickly look at the back of the book and see a brief explanation of it. So I just wanted to show that there's lots and lots of different footnotes throughout the book. Um, and every single book that is mentioned, if you look at that first paragraph where it says Hebrew book of concealed mystery, mm -hmm. and then bracket Sifra Zenuta, I'm probably saying that wrong, but That's good. Um, everything it, that isn't in English. So there are lots of German books from German philosophers and French books by French occultists, for example. The, the English is given and the original title of the, uh, of the other language as well, where, where we've been able to find it and verify it. Um, so you've got, it's, it's as modernized as possible. Did you have anyone help you with this project or was it just you? Did you have anyone doing some footwork for you? Because I would imagine that you couldn't just Google all of this. There was quite a bit of research that needed to be done. Um, yes, I mean, I have a wonderful editor who, who helps. Um, and also there, there are quite a lot of things you can find online. There's a wonderful website called archive.org and it's got lots and lots of books um, from, you know, as way back as the 15th century, for oh. example, that have all been digi digitalized and you can access most of them. So, um, books from, from the 1700s and the 1800s that Blavatsky was referring to, you can quite often, often find them on um, archive.org. And that's where I, I went to find these original uh, sources and original references to, to check, check them all out. That is brilliant, brilliant. It's see the modern world, this is our tool. This is the gift of the last century. At the end of the last century, something comes through to help these teachings go forth. And I believe the internet is absolutely essential. Um, and I was gonna ask you about the, the term hermetic. We hear that often uh, in my mind. I think of you know the vacuums of today, sealed. So uh, would you mind me asking you if I, I could look it up, but I was just gonna ask you if somebody is, is watching, they wanted to know what hermetic means for one who hasn't come across it these sealed or secret, uh, how would you describe the word hermetic? Movement? Well, uh, if we go to the next slide, it oh. gives exactly that page, I think. Good. Okay, <laughs> let's go to the next slide. Okay, here we are at slide three. Bring it on, Moon Laramie and hermetic. Okay, so th there's the, the footnote from that other page. Yeah. So when you go to, to the notes section, um, there's lots and lots of footnotes explaining different things. We've got Phaedrus by Plato, if you're not sure what that is. Uh, the Kalmuks, a Buddhist people of, from Mongolia, um, Knossos, the ancient city where King Minos had the Minotaur, um, and as, as you said, Hermetic, um, it's, it explains that it's also called Hermeticism or Hermetism, mm -hmm. and it's a religious philosoph philosophical and esoteric tradition based primarily on the writings uh, of Hermes Trismegistus. And they greatly influenced the Western esoteric tradition and rose to prominence during the Renaissance and the Reformation. Um, and the ideas of Hermes Trismegistus um, speak of a, a Prisca theologia, which is kind of a truth which was handed down to uh, humanity um, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. But of course, now in our very material cycle of you know, being on the fourth globe, mm. the fourth round, 
um, we are very far away from that kind of, of understanding of, of, the, of those spiritual, spiritual truths. If you'd like to find out more, if you're watching and wondering what we're talking about with rounds and chains and globes, more can be found in theosophy. Just keep listening and keep watching and follow your nose and uh, keep looking into the, the term theosophy, theos, God, Sophia, the wisdom, the ancient truth. This is the um, divine science, divine knowledge based on fact, not faith. And if you want to learn what he's talking about, one, get the book, two, also, keep looking, keep looking. You don't have, there's not one source, uh, but we are in, as he said, we're in a, in a time that is much different. And also I wanted to ask you about uh, Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great, this this truth. I, I think when I was younger, I thought this is one person. It is, is many people, many truths coming through. Is that your understanding? Yes, I mean, Hermes Trismegistus is a kind of um, unified figure of the, the god Hermes um, and god Thoth. So um, there are, I can't remember how many books there are now in, in the Hermetica, but it's a huge um, number of volumes. And um, there, there's a lot of debate on, on exactly who, who wrote it. Lots and lots of different people did, uh, we think, and it's been attributed to uh, Hermes Trismegistus as kind of part of this early, early knowledge. The, I apologize for interrupting. I just wanted to uh, say, I think it might be human nature for us to want to look for a, a figure outside of ourselves or uh, an avatar, uh, a sage, uh, someone who is not us to bring the wisdom in. When we're in theosophy, we are taught that is, it is within us, it is within all of us. And this truth, once applied and put into practical application, that's what the sages through the ages have been telling us. But I think when we're thinking of these myths, legends, uh, Hermes, the philosophers, all that, we think that they're so much different than we are. They are us. It is us that we're talking about. Is that your understanding as well? Yes. Yes. I think you put it brilliantly. Oh, I don't know about that, but I, I think that this is, I mean, this is a stellar work. Thank you. It's just an honor to be able to speak with you. I do want to get to the, the Greta Garbo as well, uh, because that was so uh, phenomenal. And I want to talk about the other books and the other things that you're doing, but we want to continue on with what we're talking about now. Again, if you're just tuning in, this is a brand new book, literally just published this week. Uh, it is Moon Laramie, who is our special guest tonight. The book is called Blavatsky Unveiled. This is Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, also known as HPB in the theosophical world. She wrote down some of the most important texts of the last 2000 years. They are humongous texts and incredibly detailed. And what he's done is he's taken the, this one, which is Isis Unveiled, and he has actually taken it sentence by sentence. Uh, there are two volumes in Isis Unveiled. This is the one. So this is just the beginning. Moon's going to be very busy for the rest of this incarnation, I'm sure of it. Um, but he's taken it sentence by sentence and been able to translate it into modern day language and understanding with footnotes uh, and explanation of, of, the, of the text and the words, because uh, that was written at the end of the 19th century. So this is a very important book uh, for any students of Theosophy. I will include a link down below on how you can get your copy. And we're going to continue on with Moon. Would you like to go to the fourth slide, Moon Laramie? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. So, there it is. ladies and gentlemen, we're on slide number four. Moon, take it away. Okay, so this is the, the third part of the book at the back. And this is the who's who section because um, as I said before, HPB mentions oh, almost 700 different people who would have been quite well known in her time, mm. but unfortunately aren't very well known. Uh, a, a lot of them aren't, aren't well known to us today. So every single person that she mentions in the texts, science, scientists that she agrees with or scientists that she doesn't agree with, they're all listed here, writers that she cites. Um, and it's not just uh, living people, it's also uh, mythological figures as well. So every kind of person or mythological figure that she cites in the text is provided in the who's who with their birth dates and some more information about them, any books that they've written, etc. So you've got quite a, a complete picture of, of every single person that's mentioned. Oh my goodness, thank you so much for this in-depth research. This is gonna help the, the modern world. I believe that uh, the, as, the, 
as the churches begin to empty out, it isn't about the buildings. They're beautiful architectural structures. But I think that people are finally hungry. One, they're talking to each other. They're starting to communicate with each other instantly all over the world. And we're finally trying to come to a, there's got to be more to life than this. And we're coming and we're finding that other people have the information. We used to just be in this regional local area and we were fed, uh, spoon fed everything uh, from a one source or two sources. And now as we begin to question who we are, where we are, what we are, why we are, um, and these answers begin to come. I know how I felt when I first discovered theosophy. I expected that door in London to be like Ikea. I always say that. Where are all the people? There needs to be this. This is what I've been looking for all my life. I like to call it the Holy Grail. It doesn't, it isn't an item. It's within you and everybody has it. So if you're looking for it and you want to find out more, I highly recommend not only, I'm not trying to sell this book. I'm trying to sell compassion. I'm trying to sell a way of life that will help you through the trials and tribulations of your life and your to understand everything from the ever expanding universe to the tiniest atom and to how to handle everyday events from divorce and death and loss, uh, financial uh, plagues, you name it, uh, ghosts, reincarnation, karma, everything is covered in these teachings of theosophy. And Moon has made it palatable, understandable, and accessible in this text, which is again called Blavatsky Unveiled. And it is fresh out on the press uh, right now. Um, and um, will you? I know you'll be doing another talk for the Theosophical Society in England. And I think I'll be with you on that one. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and uh, also, are you going on a, on a speaking circuit for this book at all? Um, well, depending on how things go, uh, you know. <laughs> from that chair, from that chair. <laughs> yeah, it might be from, from this chair. I mean, uh, there's a wonderful bookshop in London, which you probably know, which is called Treadwell's. Yes. And they're an esoteric bookshop and um, they're incredibly supportive. So I've given talks there before and uh, we're going to be working with them to to give talks about the book. Um, we haven't decided how that's going to work yet, but um, it's a wonderful space. If we, once all of this is over, all of this madness uh, and we can all get out again much more easily and, and be together again. Um, Treadwells, if for, for anyone who's in or around London, um, it's, a, it's a great place to go to uh, for marvellous talks, not just on theosophy. There's lots and lots of talks on all sorts of esoteric traditions every, every day of the week, really. Uh, oh, it's a really brilliant. Place. Well, yeah. that's, the, that's the thing with these uh, mystic uh, occult bookstores, uh, the, the bad rap that the New Age movement and the church has given to that. These, uh, it's my understanding that the New Age movement was cherry picked from these teachings. What is your thought on that? Yes? Yes, I mean, well, Blavatsky is often called the, the mother of the, of the New Age, in a way, because a lot of, a lot of the ideas that she was talking about uh, have, be, have found their way into, into different traditions in, in the New Age. And in fact, somebody I know said um, that you, you always find your way back to Blavatsky. From all of these different ideas, you find your way back to Blavatsky. So um that was actually christina oakley harrington who is the owner of treadwell's bookshop oh that's She's good See? always find your way back to that <laughs> that's a really brilliant quote and i will use that again because i remember how was this hidden from me how did i not know about this it was light on the path that was first it was the 14 lessons uh, by yogi ramasharaka william walker atkinson that was pointing towards light on the path that pointed towards theosophy and then i thought what is this? I need to look this up. And when I found it, it just was a, um, a friend of mine says it feels like coming home. Um, it's, it's hard to describe the way that it feels. Uh, for those who don't know, as a recovering Catholic, a lot of people are like, why do you go on about this stuff all the time? I said, because it changed my life and I believe it will help you. I believe the, these teachings are based on facts, not faith, not a hope and not some spiritual superhero that's going to descend from the clouds and fix everything. It is self work it is happening within yourself and through the practical application in your daily life and that includes not just a moment where you're reading by the bedside it includes when you're in a traffic jam and somebody cuts you off it includes when you have uh just traumatic and really fantastic things take place that's when theosophy is to put be put into practice and it doesn't have to be so serious and stuffy either i think it it can have uh i mean laughter is a part of life don't you think yeah, well, I mean, I find a tremendous joy in in theosophy. I, yeah. I know we're on we're on a path of lots of different incarnations, and we have so much to learn. 
Mm. Um, and sometimes it's very challenging and, and so difficult with different things, but also it's, it's a wondrous place. I mean, the earth is a wondrous place to be. So there's so much joy as well to be experienced in all these different incarnations and so much learning. I mean, that's one of the things that, that really attracts me, the idea that, you know, we've got this wonderful path to tread and you can take your time. You know, I know there are certain things I haven't achieved and I may not achieve them for another couple of thousand lives, you know, but I'm doing my <laughs> best. <laughs> it's true. A lot of people say, I don't want to come back. You know, I don't want to have to come back. I'm like, oh, I used to think that way too. I <laughs> used to think that way too. But it says until the very last teardrop is dry, our work is not done here. Um, so, um, gosh, there's so many things I wanted to talk to you about. I looked up at the time. Um, uh, nature, you mentioned the, the value of nature. You were discussing that in your in your talk that I did want to front sell, which was fantastic. The self-actualization of Greta Garbo, which is, is beyond belief uh, to watch you speak on that, but also... Uh, the book itself is called The Spirit of Garbo, correct? And yeah. that, that will be available. I'll, I'll include a link to that as well if I can. Um, I, if you don't mind, because it was such a remarkable um, insight into uh, who we've always heard. I thought it was so fantastic when you explained of course, being a tour guide at Universal Studios, what we were told is I want to be alone um, is not what she meant. Would you mind explaining to this audience what that, for those who don't know, Greta Garbo, a film star, a humongous, beautiful, amazing, incredible being, um, but a film star that was attributed, the quote was always, I want to be alone. And it was always a big thing, but that's not what she meant. Moon, can you tell us what she really meant? What she, well, there are two things. I mean, she did, she did crave um, solitude in a way, but she didn't feel alone because she would often be out in nature and she felt that nature was her companion. But she upset the media and she upset the, the movie industry because she wouldn't play ball. Mm -hmm. So she wouldn't go to Hollywood movie premieres. She thought the whole thing of people screaming at you because you've acted in a film was ridiculous. It was for her. Yeah. So, so she didn't go and, and she upset the, the media. She upset the newspapers. So when she said, she actually said, I want to be left alone, mm -hmm. meaning I don't want people chasing me around. You know, I, I want to act. It's the thing I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really want lots of people chasing me around and screaming and, and, and making up stories about me. So I, I want to be left alone. Now the media didn't like that because they had nothing to get from her. So um, they said, they said she's no, she's, she's lonely, she's sad. And you know, I want to be alone. She's just a terrible old misery, which wasn't true. I mean, she had a fantastic social life when she wanted it. Mm -hmm. She knew Aristotle Onassis. She was always down in the Mediterranean. Um, you know, during the summer and staying in places, going out in nature. She had lots and lots of very close friends, um, but not huge numbers. I mean, uh, there's, this, there's this joke about Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton saying that they had a wedding for about 2,000 close personal friends. I mean, <laughs> it's not possible. It's not possible. So Greta Garbo wasn't like that. She was much more real, I think. And you know, the whole thing about the glamour and dr dressing up. She only did that for the parts that she played. When she was at home or, or out during her own private life, she never wore a, a jot of makeup. She wore an old jumper, an old hat, and that, she went to meet Krishnamurti in an old jumper and an old hat, yeah. old straw hat and a pair of old, old slacks. I think that's wonderful that she doesn't look at the adoration of the physical body, which still now in 2020, just because they have a job where they're singing or performing a sport, all of a sudden they become gods. What's the, have we not evolved? What is the matter that, I mean, and we pay our, our school teachers and, and public servants, something is terribly wrong. And the working at Universal Studios, when people would get starstruck, I'm thinking that that's, it's, it's they got lucky. They got a job, they do a job, they get paid for a job, they're no different than me and you. And, and Krishnamurti, whatever he was wearing that day is no different than Greta's jumper or his shoes or the, the Dalai Lama. People are like, oh, to touch the garment. I'm like, it's yours too. 
Mm-hmm. Yours too. So I love that she wasn't, uh, and that's really trailblazing back in the day for her to be speaking up like that because so many people, that is what set the tone for the media, sets what is beauty and what is worth and what is important. Um, but she went against the grain. So a brilliant work done by you. I would love to talk more about that actually. That is called The Spirit of Garbo. And again, it is described as a uh, by Aeon, by Gnostic Radio. They said, again, and I repeated this at the beginning, and I'm going to repeat it here because I believe it's very accurate. It is a spiritual manual for many beneficial spiritual pursuits of um, the, the late Greta Garbo, who did not mean, I want to be alone, to be a dramatic, uh, what do you call it, a diva, but she meant the solitude from the paparazzi, surely we understand that now, and also the solitude of, of nature, which is the true church. And that t- is talked about in theosophy as well. You're the temple, that's the church. We've been destroying that church to build these buildings where there's absolutely nothing in there. And there's no one coming to save you but yourself. And if you wanna find out more, you definitely need to check this book out. And let's make sure my light's not on that. This is Moon Laramie, our special guest tonight. Blavatsky unveiled what he has done again is taken these texts that were written down written down not written by not coming up she did not come up with them she wrote them down Helena Petrovna Blavatsky wrote down Isis unveiled the secret doctor and the voice of the silence but this is Isis unveiled that's where he's starting so there's lots more to come taking it line by line and deciphered it and written it in modern English so the meaning is the same but the understanding is more attainable for today's modern world. And um, this is, I believe that theosophy is the future. I absolutely believe that the time has come. It seems like there's, it might've been the COVID thing that kind of pushed the um, the lodges in to force them to go ahead and log online because they were kind of not, a lot of them were like, no, 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 we'll still stay the old fashioned way. But now everybody's trying not to book meetings where everybody else is having speaker meetings. And I'm like, no, go for it. Who cares? They, they catch the rewatch. We're, if we have a problem with booking too many theosophical things online, that is a good problem to have, I think. Don't you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Is there anything we, we haven't touched on that you'd like to speak about at all? Um, I would love to, to be able to touch on anything and everything to, because I have you here. Um, is there anything else you'd like to speak about? The, the books that are going to come, I, I can imagine if this one took four and a half years, she, are you going to do The Secret Doctrine? <laughs> Eventually, yeah. I mean, it's going to be 30 years. I, th- I think I'll, I'll, I'll probably be 89 or something by the time I finish the last line. But yes, um, and I wanted to start with Isis Unveiled. So people have said, you know, why did you start with Isis Unveiled? But it's yeah. the first one. Yeah. So yeah. I wanted to start where she started and take that journey with her. Yep. So you started where she started. These, again, just because we say they're daunting doesn't mean that they don't pack a powerful punch. I attend a study group meeting where we just take little lines at a time and just digest them and revisit them and just spending time with them literally feels, Moon, like somebody is playing a golden harp of pure bliss across the hole in my chest. I can't explain it. I just feel there's nowhere else I'd rather be. There's nothing more important to do than to share these teachings with the world. Again, they are not a dogma. This is not a religion. This is fact, not faith, based on science, philosophy, and the study of the commonality of all the world's religions. This came first. I know these texts are written at the end of the 19th century, but these teachings are ancient. They predate humanity and they are going to be the future. They will, I believe, what it's coming, the coming together of humanity. What do you see as the future for theosophy, Moon Laramie? Um, I think, as you said, you know, we need to, we need to be open and accessible and we need to be more modern. So I think the, the, the key word for me is, is modern, modernity. Um, and we've tried to do that as well with the with the modern theosophy books, um, where we've taken a text, uh, a short pamphlet or, or a talk from somebody who was a theosophist from, you know, uh, we, we've got Blavatsky paired with Pablo Sender. Oh, love that. Um, we've got Annie Besant yeah. uh, paired with Dr. Barbara B. Hebert, who is the president of the TS in America. Yes. And, yes. and what we tried to do was, was produce a book each time on a particular subject, which is uh, the the writings of an original theosophist 
and the writings of somebody who is a modern theosophist today. So for example, Pablo Sender's book, um, Theosophy and Consciousness, yes. uh, you've got a Blavatsky text in there, a short Blavatsky text on consciousness, and you've also got Pablo talking about consciousness in terms of, of what it means for us today. And we've done that with um, social, there's Theosophy and Social Justice, Theosophy and the Search for Happiness, oh. um, the purpose of Theosophy, Yes, um, yes, yeah. oh, theosophy. I'm so excited. This is so, it, it feels like, uh, I hope, it feels like I have hope, you know, for the for the future. Whenever I have uh, one of these sessions and I meet these, these beautiful, compassionate souls that understand the importance of these teaching and want to do, uh, be of service, to carry it out into the world uh, with selflessness. It isn't about the individual. It isn't about Moon. It isn't about me. It isn't about HPB. It's about the teachings. And then eventually it's about you. When you get right down to it, it's you that this is about. Theosophy is all about you. So if you've been looking for it like we were when we found it, I know how I felt. I know Moon described how he felt as well. I've been looking for this all my life. And it is within you. These teachings, if you study them, and it isn't just memorizing them so you can pontificate them to other theosophists, it's about applying them. And then when you become them, you revisit them again and new information comes out of the same text. How is that possible? Moon, I've never been able to understand that. Do you have any insight on that? Um, well, I think it's wonderfully written and there's so much there's so much in there. It's so rich and it's so deep that you can literally return to the same sentence and think, oh, it's oh. true. It's yeah. true. It's true. I thought it was like, it felt like almost like a magic box. I'm like, there's no way that light on the path, this little pamphlet, could possibly, because I voiced that text. I voiced it, I've produced it, I've edited it, I've done study things on it, and it's tiny. And there's no way that it can do something different. I'll open it, completely different. Craziest thing in the world. I just don't understand. I think it might just be, there's something more than just written word here. There's something here that is uh, very valuable. And I think as you spend time with it and you become it, it becomes you, maybe. I don't know how else to say it. I don't, I still don't even know what I'm doing. I just know that as a former radio and TV uh, person, I feel that my voice should be doing something more important than talking about Steven Tyler. And I believe that I want to be of service to humanity. I'd like to help in whatever way I can. And seeing this, this is so inspiring. Seeing that you spent four and a half years taking each line by line and making it palatable and understandable for the modern world. This gives me hope for the future. Moon Laramie, thank you so much for spending this hour together. Can you believe it's been an hour already? No. I know, I know, we're coming up on an hour. Um, I will include the links down below. There will be speaking uh, engagements. Uh, I'm not sure if they'll be in person or not, but I know we will have one for the Theosophical Society uh, headquarters out of England, which is my home lodge. That's on Garbo as a, a theosophy. She was very interested in theosophy. Yes. So, so that's the 5th of December. Okay, so we will be together again for that. I will be um, hosting that with Damon, um, but uh, that is such a fantastic subject and something that until you, I did not know that at all about Garbo. And I had worked in Hollywood uh, and did not know any of that. The, the spirituality was never mentioned. The, the, you, you talked about some things about, her, she had a mystic quality about her um, that was, um, I don't know if it was felt or seen. How would you describe Greta Garbo's mystic appeal um, to those who are not familiar with it. Um, she was well, beautiful, but more than that. He, Louis B. Mayer. There you the, go. The reason, yes, yes. The reason he first, <laughs> yeah, the reason he first um, <laughs> wanted to hire Greta Garbo yeah. was because there was something absolutely magical behind the eyes and he hadn't seen it before. Really? And other people who, who met her said that there was just this strange quality that she exuded um, and, that, and that's why people were drawn to watching her on screen as well. They came, they came out feeling slightly different. So really? maybe she was doing a bit of theosophy out there as well. You never well, know. she must have, yeah, her astral self must have radiated forth because I think we see what we perceive as physical beauty. And whenever, you know, we look at you, we see what we are, really. I think if, if a lot of people say, oh, you know, that person makes me angry, blah, 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 I go, that's a definition of what's going on inside of me at, at that time. If that is whatever. If I see beauty, then that must mean there's beauty inside. She must have exuded something that people were able to relate to because she was striking, but so were a lot of women at that time. But no one was ever described in the way that I've heard you describe her. 
Um, and uh, shame on me too, I should have known Metro Goldwyn Mayer as a Universal Studios tour guide. I should have known that as well. But yes, you covered that in great depth in your book and you will of course on the, at the talk that is coming up and then will be available for rewatch with the Theosophical Society headquarters out of um, London, England. Uh, love everybody up there. Petra Meyer, absolutely love her. She's been on this channel uh, several times. She is amazing. You've worked with her. She's a powerhouse. She just is as far as getting this information together, um, selfless purely selfless. And that is, she's one of my favorite theosophists in the world. Uh, absolutely love her. Um, and just, just cranking it out, getting it out there and always reminding at the end that it isn't about the words and memorizing them. It, remove your mind from it and go to your heart. Yes, go to your heart. And that's where uh, the self-application, how would you say uh, in, in the way that I close with Petra, is there anything that you'd like to say to somebody who does purchase this book and they're just beginning their journey in theosophy? How would you say uh, that they approach this subject if it ticks their box and they feel that same excitement? Do you have any advice for those who are beginning their first steps on the path? Um, I think it's wonderful to get to know other people as well, because I think we model things for each other. Mm. So the more that I've got to know other theosophists, the more I've seen wonderful things in them. And it's touched me. So for example, I spent time with Petra, who is absolutely wonderful. And she's just, she exudes this wonderful calmness, yes. absolutely wonderful calmness that just makes you feel at ease. And she, as you say, she is an absolute powerhouse. She knows. <laughs> so much, so much. Um, she's absolutely incredible but I think spending time with other theosophists you see what gentle people they are yeah. and it's it's just a wonderful thing to to feel that um mm. sense of, of being together on 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 this path so I would encourage people to to you know try and get to know other other people um and sometimes you can use the internet to do that yeah um, so also now than ever, I think that it's, it's more attainable. I used to be just by myself thinking that because I was I didn't want the, the gurus that would pop up, you know, these the, the gurus that would be like, it's all about me and I'm doling this out. I'm like, that is so the church. You're being the church about it. Stop. These teachings belong to everybody and it isn't about you. And you didn't write that down. That's not a new idea. And so I would keep just to myself. I was anti joining anything because if I corrupted, then I only corrupted myself. And if I was able to learn that I could learn by myself. But then I thought it's terribly lonely. It is terribly lonely. And I would love to be able, it was through Damon that said, he said to come on. And I was like, okay, but if I see any elitism or weirdness, I'm stepping out again. I can't do that. And then I've said, I've seen nothing but amazing, loving, beautiful souls that are here to serve humanity. And I'm so grateful for the internet that allows us to be together. You know, I'm there with you in real time. And on Sunday night, uh, they will be with us in real time as well, watching this in the comments section. So thank you all of you for commenting. I apologize. I got so wrapped up in Moon and the, uh, the book. Uh, I forgot to talk about the commenters, but we will get to those comments. Uh, I'll be there live on Sunday. Uh, and again, the, the book is called Blavatsky Unveiled. And I apologize for the lighting there. Uh, brand new on store shelves right now. I will include the link in the bio. And uh, Moon, again, we're looking forward to having you speaking about Greta Garbo. Um, that'll be with the Theosophical Society out of England, the headquarters. That'll be a live uh, broadcast uh, at a seminar. And then we will have that up online as well. So we'll be seeing more from you. And we also know that you probably need a break because if you've got Isis and Bale 2, Secret Doctrine 1, and Secret Doctrine 2. And you have to spend all that time. I just, I, I just thank you for your service. Thank you. That is amazing. And that is, it's so such a loving thing to do, um, to bring it into the modern world. It's been desperately needed to be done. And thank you for doing it. Is there anything you'd like to say before we close? Um, I, I just love doing it. So, um, you know, if it helps other people, it's fantastic. I'm going to keep on doing it with my cup of tea and sometimes maybe a double decker or a Kit Kat and, you know, <laughs> just keep on. And it's fantastic. So Thank it's fantastic you. fun for me and I hope other people get, you know, whatever they need to or want to get out of it. Oh, we're so grateful for you. Thank you for all that you are and do. Thank you very much for being with us tonight, Moon. We really enjoyed it. Thank you, everyone. Again, go get your copy, Blavatsky Unveiled. And Moon, we will see you again soon. Thank you all very much. Living Theosophy is brought to you in part by the Theosophical Society headquarters out of London, England. If you haven't taken the diploma course, they start at the top of the year. I highly recommend that. And also, also I want to give a shout out to the Virtual Center for Theosophical Studies, which is a global group.
um, and I'm one of the volunteers on that, where we are targeting um, folks 45 years of age and under. And if you'd like to be a part of that, there's a link in the uh, in the description down below. So thank you very much, all of you, for being here. I love you, and Moon, we'll see you again soon. <laughs>